Hey folks, I'm Josh. Welcome back to the shop. Today, we're gonna make one of these guys. What is that? It's pretty fun. So this is a, I guess you could call it a, a wiro or a rasp, um, and it vaguely resembles a frog. Um, I've made one that kind of looks like an iguana as well, but uh, they're pretty cool. Fun little instruments that you can make. All you need is a hunk of wood, and then another hunk of wood to make a little mallet. And so, I've always think they're pretty fun. So, they are based on, if you've ever seen one, one of these. So here is one that I purchased, and um, they're really slick. I mean, it's big and deep and fun and really cool, well carved, but way more intricate than what I was hoping to make. So you can pick one of these guys up for like eight bucks on Amazon. And if that's what you're looking for, go get one because it's way quicker and easier than making one yourself. But making one yourself is kind of fun. So this is obviously an adaptation of that. It's a little bit more simplified and uh, you probably don't need as specialized a tools to pull that off. Um, the, the real trick is the hollowing portion. You have to be able to get inside and hollow out inside there some. Who knows how they hollowed theirs because this thing is hollow almost all the way through, which is pretty darn impressive. Some people's craftsmanship is awesome. So we're gonna try to keep it simple though, and uh, try to use what hopefully most folks have laying around. And uh, so we're gonna make one kind of like this. The first thing you're gonna need here is a block of wood. Now, the wood of choice is gonna be probably a hardwood because you want it to be able to hold up. If you use something too soft, the spines here aren't gonna hold up to the, the mallet rubbing on there. So, probably don't wanna use anything too soft. Shoot for something in the harder range. This is a piece of maple. Um, I think most any hardwood would probably work. If you wanna get real technical and fancy, you should look for a tone wood, um, but that can get more challenging and I think you'll still get really fun sounds and effects out of stuff that's not even truly considered a tone wood. So um, this is a piece of maple. Um, this one is also a piece of maple. I have made one out of ash and it also works just fine. Um, I think oak would also be a really good choice. Uh, you know, whatever hardwood you got around. So, uh, the first thing to consider is size. This particular piece happens to be, whoops, happens to be oh, about just under four inches long, about three and a quarter tall, and just over three inches thick. So it's gonna be a little bigger than this guy because I'm gonna orient him like this, uh, about the same dimensions, but he's gonna be almost twice as wide. Hopefully it'll be a little bit bigger and deeper sound. That's kind of what I'm shooting for. Um, so anyway, th th this piece of wood is not really all that square. The only thing I really made sure was that this is roughly coplanar to this so that when I'm cutting this out, it's gonna it's gonna be straight roughly. So now we just got to put our design on here, and I'm just gonna kind of freehand what I'm going for. So we're gonna go for something like this. So I like the looks of that, and that's what we're gonna go with. Shaded in all the uh, waste wood that's gonna be cut away. First things first, I want to drill this hole before we do any other cutting because I have a nice big solid block to clamp uh, so that I can do the drilling more easily. If we do the cutting first, it gets more challenging to hold while you drill that big hole. So let's drill the hole. All right, so we are over at the drill press now and if you don't have a big drill press, this may not work and this may not even work on my drill press, but I'm gonna give it a shot. Um, so I have a three quarters inch uh, Forstner bit here and I'm going to use that to get the hole going and I may have to devise some other method of finishing it because if you look My block is bigger than that. So I don't know uh, You there's a couple ways you could solve this problem. You could uh, very precisely measure 
on both sides and drill in until they meet. And that may be what I end up having to do uh, and meet in the middle, which isn't gonna matter if you're off a bit because you're gonna be hollowing and removing a lot of that wood anyway and it's gonna, not gonna really matter. What's gonna matter is how it looks on the outside. So as long as you measure fairly close on the outside, that'll look okay. Uh, you could use a spade bit and hand drill because uh, a lot of drill presses don't have enough space to do a spade bit um, because spade bits are usually longer. Uh, if you have a really long drill bit for whatever reason, use that. Um, or you could use a hand auger and you do that by hand because those are, you know, auger bits are usually long enough to do that, no problem. So uh, you're going to have to, you know, think through whatever you got as far as a big drill bit to make a hole as big as your piece. Now, of course, you could make it thinner and then this, this would, you know, any, any typical drill bit would be big enough. But I'm, we're pushing the limits here, so we'll see what happens. And then as far as the size of the hole goes, obviously size it to how big you're gonna make your guy. Um, but also you need to think about your hollowing method, which we'll talk about later, and make sure that your bit is big enough for whatever hollowing method you're using to be able to get in there to hollow out the guy. So uh, let's get drilling, we'll see what happens. We are really close. We're just almost all the way through there. Uh, we can actually check that real quick. Gah, so close. So we're just gonna punch the rest of the way through with a uh, auger, hand auger bit, this guy. So I got this, put it in the vise. Yeah. Well, that was dirty. Well, that's what I get for not drilling from the other side once it went through just a little bit. But we'll clean that up. It'll be all right. So what I should have done is, as soon as the very tip poked through the far side, I should have flipped it over and drilled from this side. But I didn't, because I wasn't thinking. But that's okay, we can fix this. We're just gonna lose a little bit of wood. Here we go. All the way through. All right, so we're over at the bandsaw now, and uh, I'm gonna cut, you know, the rough shape out here, uh, but I don't think I'm gonna cut the mouth just yet. I'm gonna leave that there, um, because if I do any carving in here with like a Dremel or a power tool of any type, uh, it's going to be louder if I cut that. So just purely for the purpose of keeping this quieter while hollowing this, I'm not going to cut the mouth yet. I'll just I'll cut that later when I'm done hollowing it out. We're all set with the bandsaw, and I think my blade could maybe use a little sharpening. I got a little bit of burning around some of the edges, and I was definitely pushing it as far as some of those curves go, so that's why I got a little bit of burn, but uh, all in all, looks all right. Uh, now it's time to start hollowing, and when it comes to hollowing, there's probably a million ways to do this. Depending on your tool availability, you could go about this in a lot of different ways. One way would be to cut it in half, and then hollow each half with like uh, like a router bit or many drill holes or a gouge or whatever you got that you could use to hollow it and then glue it back together. As long as you had a really clean cut, you and depending on your wood choice, you may not even see the glue line if you do it really well. I'm gonna try to do it without cutting it in half. And my first thought is I'm gonna use a Forstner bit that's a little smaller than the hole, and I'm gonna to try to go in at several different angles and remove as much wood as I can. I may use this Dremel bit a little bit. This is uh, just a high-speed cutter for a Dremel, and uh, the only issue with that is I won't be able to get in too far. I'm restricted somewhat by the size of everything. So we'll probably do a little bit with that, and then I may have to go and resort to some good old-fashioned uh, gouge work. So we'll see kind of how things go as we get progressing. Um, 
depending on your vice and work holding situation, it might be easier to do some of this hollowing before you cut the band uh, on the bandsaw because if you have nice square edges for clamping, it might be easier to get in there. It's just a little bit harder to tell how much wood you have left. Uh, at least I think it's harder to tell how much wood you have left if you don't have the shape to reference already cut out. So, you know, you gotta do whatever's gonna work for you. And then as far as how much you leave, you wanna leave a good, at least a quarter inch of wood all the way around, I think. Um, anything less than that and you're gonna start risking having it being too weak, I think. So at least a quarter inch left all the way around and you wanna to try to hollow as much in here as you can. So if you were to envision the center being removed here, you would be hollowing probably everything you could inside that shape, basically. So all of this that you can get away and of course leaving enough thickness right here for it to be okay. We're gonna clamp it up. My clamping situation is this. I have my, um, just my front vise and then these are some really thick foam pads that I'm gonna use to pad the work while I'm holding it. Now don't go doing this with a really nice drill bit because this isn't gonna be good for the drill bit. And also don't do it if you're not confident in your ability to hold it. Um, this is, you know, a slightly awkward way of doing things. Uh, you could do this on your drill press if you have a nice way of holding this while you're trying to drill. So anyway, we'll see how things go. Helps if you're spinning your drill the right way. I think we've done about all we can do with the drill. Now I know they make like a hollowing bit that you could put in a drill. I don't have one of those. So the Forstner bit it was, and uh, that Forstner bit is rather dull and beaten. It's an old one, so I'm not too concerned about it. Definitely, like I said before, do not do that with a good bit. Uh, you will very likely ruin it. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna try and clear out a little bit more with the gouge before we go to the next step. So I'm just gonna put it back in the vise and uh, use the gouge and maybe a mallet a little bit to kind of take out what I can inside there. So at this point, I've done pretty much all the hollowing I think I'm gonna get done. And I'm just trying to clean up the inside a little bit because I'm assuming you you know, this is really a resonation chamber and the smoother that chamber is, the better the sound is gonna work and bounce around inside there. So at this point, I'm just trying to kind of smooth it out as best I can with the gouge. And of course I'm restricted, but it's looking pretty good in there. So the next thing I wanna do is I wanna I want to taper the face a little bit here. I want to I want to kind of bring in and cut off the edges and just give it a little bit of a taper, but I want it to be consistent and I'm going to do it on the bandsaw. So the way I'm going to do that, uh, and I also, I don't really want to trim the feet, I don't think. So what that means is that I need to be able to cut on the bandsaw at an angle. Um, and so the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to clamp this guy up in this butt, in this um, in this clamp at an angle, which will give me a nice flat surface to reference off the bandsaw, and then I can cut in a way that won't hit his feet. Um, so I got to give myself some lines to go by on the bandsaw. So we're going to try to lay that out a bit with the square here. So hopefully this gives you a pretty good idea of what I'm talking about. I've got the, f the frog clamped up in this clamp here, and the clamp can then sit on the bed of the bandsaw and give me plenty of nice flat surface to hang on to everything and, and not have a catch so that it would snap that piece down. Because if I was to try to freehand this, there's nothing supporting this front edge and there's a chance it would catch and, and do some damage. So my goal here is at this angle, I'm just gonna slice the top end off of the frog here, but this way it'll be consistent on both sides and I won't hit the feet because I'm coming at an angle because of the 
the way it's set up in the clamp. So we didn't remove a ton of wood, but it gives it a little bit of character and makes it look a little bit more, I don't know, frog-like with a little bit of a point to it. And uh, you could do that with a handsaw, of course, but I didn't. So the next thing I want to do is I want to drill the holes for the eyes. And so I have marked on each side where I want those to go. Uh, and then I'm using a 7 30 seconds drill bit, I believe, to drill these out. And now it is time for some serious sanding. So I want to, on the belt sander, round over all these edges because we don't want any sharp edges uh, for two reasons. One, you don't want to hurt anybody and also uh, anything too sharp is likely to chip uh, while it's being used. So we're going to round those over a little bit. Um, and then I'm going to hit every surface I can on the belt sander. Uh, to hopefully get rid of these burn marks and smooth everything out. And then um, I also want to kind of taper these in a bit. So I'm going to give myself a line uh, on each spike and then a line over here to go to and, and then remove on the sander that on each side. And really the lines are probably not necessary, but they will help me, you know, it'll just kind of help guide the sanding a little bit. Uh, I could probably just do it by eye, but... I'm still gonna still gonna mark it out. So I'm just gonna mark out an eighth inch on the top of every spike. Over to the sander. Well, that's about all the sanding I can do for now. I'm waiting on a, well, I could hand sand it, of course, but I have a small belt sander, but I'm waiting on a replacement bearing for it. So I'm, uh, I'm gonna hold off on that. It'll be here in a couple of days. And uh, when you only got an hour in the shop every day, give or take, uh, that's okay. Cause you know, there's always something else to work on. So we're actually gonna work on the, the mallet that's gonna work with this guy. And um, a couple of considerations for that. The first thing is you want, Diameter wise, you want part of it, at least I want part of it, to be bigger than the hole here, but most of it to be smaller than the hole so that it can actually rest in the um, in the rasp when I'm not using it. It'll actually kind of stick through, but then the, there'll be an enlarged part on one side that'll actually be the part that you use to strike the rasp or whatever to, to kind of run up its back. But the, the handle part, the smaller part, will be small enough to fit through the hole in his mouth so that it can rest in there and then kind of wedge in there because it'll kind of slowly get a little bit bigger. So that means that you have to have something that's bigger diameter than that hole. Um, so I got my caliper set for that and I got a piece of maple um, on the lathe here that is oh about an inch and a half by an inch and a half, give or take, somewhere in that neighborhood, and a little over six inches long, because I want it to be long enough that it kind of sticks out uh, enough here for the handle and then enough over here for the striking of the rasp. So I think I think six inches is a good size for this guy. So that's, that's gonna be kind of how I go. So I'm gonna rough turn the whole thing down to about an inch, I think, because I don't, I don't think it needs to be bigger than that. So I'm gonna rough turn the whole thing to an inch and then I will kind of shape from there. So um, I will put on my mask and shield and we'll get to it.
I got the replacement bearing for my belt sander in the mail. So I put that in and now I have a belt sander again. So we're gonna use that to do some sanding and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I sanded and then I sanded some more, and here's the final result. Looking pretty good. So now we're ready for finish. So my finish of choice is Mahoney's Finishes Oil Wax Finish. The finish has had time to soak in and now all I gotta do is go through with a clean cloth and wipe it all off. And maybe give it a little bit of a buff. Well, all right, here she is. Pretty cool looking. Turned out pretty nice. It's pretty fun. So, you can go a lot of different ways with this, and this is one of the bigger ones that I've made. I tried a couple of different styles. So here's a smaller little longer maybe a lizard looking kind of guy with a smaller little mallet. Much higher sound and honestly it's kind of piercing and a little hard on the ears. But it's very effective. And then here's a Slightly different frog kind of shape, a little bit narrower. Not as good of a sound on this one. I didn't do as nice a job of hollowing, and because the hole is so big, it didn't get, you know, there's just not as much of a chamber in there for resonation. Still works though. But this one's pretty slick. So to compare that, So here's the purchased one that you can get. Really cool sound. A little bit different than what I got. Well, thanks for watching. I hope that was helpful and then uh Maybe you go out and make a little frog rasp. I hope that whoever it uh, is intended for enjoys it. And uh, if you enjoyed the video, like, subscribe, leave a comment, all that. And uh, those things help me out. Thanks for watching. Hope you have a good one.